Hi, this is Gary Levine of Roaring Brook Art Licensing, and you're listening to the Inspiration Place podcast with Miriam Shulman. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. This is episode 10 of the Inspiration Place podcast. And today I have art agent and owner of Roaring Brook Art Licensing, Gary Levine. The reason I invited Gary is because we're going to dig deep into what art agents are looking for. Whether you work in multiple styles, if you've ever wondered how much money you can make as a licensed artist, all that is covered in this episode. Gary is passionate about art and has spent the better part of his career working and selling to mass market retail. Roaring Brook Art Licensing puts together his passion and knowledge, marketing and licensing commercial designs to wholesalers and retailers, both brick and mortar as well as e-commerce. Roaring Brook's focus and relationships include contracts with manufacturers in the home decor, gift housewares, and stationary industries in such products as dinnerware, bath accessories, kitchen textiles, wall decor, outdoor entertaining, paper and party products, storage boxes, and bedding. So Gary, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm so excited to talk to you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm new to you. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Um, I should give you actually a little more context about me as well. So I am a professional artist and my audience are not so professional, but with the podcast that might change. There's there's a lot of artists wannabes that I that I serve, but there's also, of course, professional artists who follow me as well. And I teach online art classes. That's really my bread and butter as well as sell my art online and in Westchester. Okay. And Uh, also online across, you know, not just Westchester, but wherever online takes me. So that's my background. I had no idea when we met that that was the case. Yeah. That's very cool. So this podcast was kind of born out of People probably asking you about what you do and where your art goes and I I guess, right? Well, it's been more of a passion project for me. I started writing for Professional Artist Magazine Mm -hmm. and I was having a lot of fun interviewing people and I loved the access that being a member of the press gave me. Uh So I knew that podcasting Mm -hmm. would basically take that to the next level. Okay. So nice. This, yeah. So I, I am. Ser- I'm doing this also to serve my audience, but yeah. I'm also following right. my curiosity with this yeah. podcast. Very cool. I uh, applaud you for that. Yeah. That's very interesting, and uh, I, that, that's awesome. Good for you. Yeah. I also call it my empty nest project. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's. Yeah. There's that too. Right. Yeah, you know. <laughs> You never, you never know where it leads to, and and if nothing else, if you're satisfying some, you know, passion or desire or whatever, then that's great. It's filling a need, and you're probably happier as a result. Yeah. So, um, you're episode number ten, and it's going to launch uh, next month. Okay. Excellent. So, yeah, and then, um, by the way, I, there's some editing that I think is that what happens. You you do some editing after, or it, it just pretty much follows along, and it is what it is. I can tease you and say everything you just said can and will be used, but um, right. no, there is, I do use, it is edited. So that's okay. why I like, I like <clears throat> to start recording basically in order, but if there's anything that we've said in the beginning that I feel it's kind of is good human interest, I'll use that as well. So yeah, okay. um, just, I would just assume well, to relax you. If you flub up, it will be edited, put it that way. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll, uh, we'll it, it is what it is, right? Right. Okay. Yes, yes. we All will right. make you sound very, very good though. All right. So I have a lot of questions today pulled from artists from all walks of life, many of whom want to break into art licensing. But before we get th- to those questions, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your business. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So first of all, um, that's a lot of different industries. Who would you say are your top clients? So 
if I have to encapsulate and summarize, it's it's really the the home decor industry is who we service, and the products that you named are really fall under the that umbrella. So we really primarily work with and and target our accounts that are in tabletop, in stationery, uh, housewares. Um, the textile industry, and all those uh, companies that then sell and manufacture and sell um, home decor products. Okay, so if I were to walk into Bed Bath & Beyond, Mm -hmm. so are they your client or do you service vendors who then sell to Bed Bath & Beyond? So good question. We primarily work with and contract with the manufacturers, uh, otherwise known as the licensees, uh, who then license our our designs, put it on their products, and they then sell to, in this case, Bed Bath & Beyond, for your example. Okay. All right. So then could you just explain this workflow from concept to product without getting too detailed, just to like, you know, the cocktail explanation of what happens. Sure. Later pitch explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we really work from two different sides of the equation. One is that we work with the artists to, we engage in dialogue and, and we give them direction and we talk about what we would like to see developed in, in terms of themes and, and colors and designs, right? On the other side of it, we do get input and requests for designs that are from the manufacturers. In fact, oftentimes those would be uh, directives from the retailers themselves. So it's really a conversation that's happening on two sides of the table. And Roaring Brook is really in the center of that. So if an artist would like to submit designs to us, really what they're imagining and what they're, they're creating and what's in their head, we welcome that. And we, there is a lot that's sold from that. And then at the same hand, the other side of it is that we'll get input specifically for certain projects. We would then pose to the artist and have them create based on those specs. Okay, so which is the more likely scenario? Is it that somebody who's a, a napkin producer, I you know forget like Casper or whoever, do they do they come to you and say you know we really want a party napkin with drafts on it, or is it the other way around where you see an artist in their portfolio that they have, you know, party drafts and you say, oh, this would be perfect for that napkin manufacturer. So it works both ways. It really does depend on who the account is, who the manufacturer is. It can often be the case where we would have the portfolio from the artist and this is what they've worked on. And perhaps Roaring Brook has given the artist some direction based on what they've shown us. And there's that dialogue without even presenting that to the account. And then we would, at a trade show or a sales meeting, we would present to, in your case, the napkin company, all of the designs that the artist has created. And this would be our spring line, for example, right? So another company might then look at or or even that napkin company might even say, well, we like these designs. How about we focus a little bit on some fall colors? Okay. So because that's really the buying season that we're in right now. Even though it's spring, the buyers are looking to uh, stock their shelves with items that are going to be in the fall. So we need we need items that have fall colors. So we might have presented a portfolio that had predominantly, let's say, spring colors, pastels or, you know, lighter, brighter colors. So that input then might come from the manufacturer. And then we'd have to, so so again, you could begin to appreciate the dialogue, the back and forth. And then how far in advance are manufacturers designing collections? Six months, a year? I was told like Christmas, it's a full year in advance that they are planning their holiday collections. Is that true? Yes. Christmas is probably one of the most planned 
programs for any retailer. Um, that that's that's an excellent example of a of a very significant lead time. In fact, it's even a little longer than a year. We're currently it's this is uh, July. We have a Christmas portfolio. The artists have made their submissions, and we're now out on the road selling the Christmas designs for Christmas 2019. But to understand, though, that's in the stores late September, early October. So you have to work backwards and imagine then, okay, this is July. Then the manufacturers need to put their samples together, incorporating the designs. They then have their meetings, their trade shows, and so on. And buyers are really making their decisions probably more like in the January timeframe. They might be putting their buys to bed for the following Christmas season. So that's a rough time frame. Other examples may not work that far in advance. There are many times where we're presented with an opportunity for a promotion, and that promotion might be a last minute open to buy. When I say last minute, it might only be, you know, three months out. Okay. Um, and, and that could be a very quick, you know, we need the designs today, turn it around, product gets in the store, you know, shipped in three months. And where would you say the balance is in terms of the tastemaker? Do you feel like that's more you or the retailer? Like who gets the most influence and what ends up being a trend in the store? Well, you know, the retailers like to drive a lot of that. They prepare trend reports. They're quite often vocal about what what they view as as what they want. They're, they're, they, they give that directive. On the other hand, I spend a lot of time out at trade shows shopping with quotes on that. And for example, last week I was at the Atlanta Gift Show. And besides meeting with my clients, I was looking at what the buyers were looking at in the showrooms. What were the trends and what are we seeing? You know, it's colors, designs, what are the metals that are showing? What are the fabrics that are on the products? And so I came back with, you know, pages and pages of notes that then I share with my artists and we have that dialogue in an art review session and they then will decide with us what they would like to create. So based on the trends that we saw. So again, it really works from different angles. And for the same matter, the other day I had an artist come to me and said, hey, I was just out shopping at the store and I saw there was cotton ball and farmhouse was everywhere. And do you want me to create something to, you know, so, so there's, they have ideas too of what they're seeing, or they might be walking with me at a trade show. And so they have their ideas as well. So again, uh, there is no one place where the trend comes from. Well, that's going to lead to now some of these other questions that I, I told you that people who are aspiring to be licensed artists have been uh-huh. asking. Yep. And they want to know, like, here. okay, we'll start with the first one. The first artist wanted to know, and I don't know the gender of any of these people. I didn't write down who they were from, but someone wants to know how to develop a distinctive color palette while still being able to design on trend. So I'm, I'm assuming this person is trying to develop their own style and color palette and yet is thinking about pleasing uh, what manufacturers are looking for. How, what would you say to that? So I will say that art is visual, okay? And I've been doing this a long time. Roaring Brook is, by the way, we're having our 15th anniversary next week. Oh, wow. Um, Congratulations. And, and pr- thank you. Uh, prior to that, I was, I'd been in the industry for a number of years before that. And, and one thing I can tell you related to the question is, is that um, I really would have to see it to understand what it is we're, we're what, what, what's the aesthetic, what's the style, what's the hand, right? Mm. Um, to really know then, oh, that would be a great look for, to use your example before, on napkins. Or, right. oh, wow, this is a really great hand. This artist has some skill with repeats. They might be good for textiles. Okay. or for bedding, for shower curtains, you know, to that. 
you know, another artist might just be more free flow, free hand, and they might have a, a, a certain aesthetic that might lend itself for wall decor, large over the sofa, you know, big canvases. I, I, it really does depend on the style and from there, and that, that is the benefit of working with an agent and someone that's been working placing designs in the industry is is that myself and my team who are also experienced have have a sense of what the designs are by looking at the hand and and where that might best be placed mm. so this brings me to another question that i hear from people a lot they want to know if as an agent when you're presented with a portfolio is it a good thing or a bad thing if an artist works in multiple styles? So it actually ultimately can be a very good thing that they work in multiple styles. The asterisk or the footnote, if you will, is that if they're working in multiple styles at the onset and they're just, you know, throwing spaghetti on the wall, so to speak. Mm. That, that can be very frustrating. Okay. So I have found that I, I actually am, it's really right down the middle, uh, that, that I've been interested in an artist who has a very specific hand and a very specific look, okay, and, and not multiple styles. And then I've also been drawn to artists who have multiple looks. And really from there, we get into a conversation and we try to focus the multiple look artist to focus on one look and, and kind of run with that. And similarly, I've taken the artist with one look and we've run with that and we've had placement and it works. And then surprisingly, we discover, including the artist, that there's a new style that's born and they may have been experimenting. They may have taken your class. They might have right. something. There, there's another part of them that in the process of working and, and doing this kind of work, they discover, wow, well, okay, you know, I've only worked with acrylics. I'm going to try, you know, pen and ink now. This is like a new thing for me. And wow, this is fun. And, you know, and now suddenly that one hand artist now is on to something else. So again, there's really no one right path. It often does help to really focus on one look and then really move on to the next one. Okay. And then here is a, a good, I feel like this is a good question. When seeking out an agent, artists are going to look for someone who they feel their art fits in with the other artists. But then that begs the question, if they already have that kind of art, do they really need your art? Very good question. We often get artists coming to us who have looked at the Roaring Brook website. Some of them have said to us, those who have actually made submissions or have reached out to contact us, they've, they, they've, we've had discussions and they say, initially, and they say, well, it looks like you're covered with this. So I actually was a little reluctant to make a submission or contact you. You know, again, it's a, it's a visual business. What they might perceive as, oh, you've got it covered, mm. might, in my team's opinion, be so far from the truth with that, that, you know, we might look at something and say, wow, okay, well, sure, they can paint shells and flowers and lighthouses, like, We've got that, but look at the richness of these colors and look at the sweeping strokes that they use with their painterly style. And this is just so unique and this is just really different and, and like nothing we have. So interesting. It is, it is a conversation. Okay. And another question. Okay. So this is a great question. What turns you off when viewing someone's portfolio? Well, I, do appreciate when artists look at the Roaring Brook website first and understand what our business is. With that said, I would say a turnoff is is when there's there's you know political art or you know art that's just so abstract. And I don't mean 
we like abstracts, but I'm saying so abstract to what the core Roaring Brook business is okay. that there there's almost a a lack of um, connection really to at all. You know, oh, I thought I'd you know show you this, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's like you know dark and 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 scary, and you know that right. that yeah, that could be never. Eternal. You would never put it on a napkin. Not on a napkin. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When artists do have more than one style, is it? Would you prefer them to submit multiple pieces in each collection? I would. I would assume that if they are working in more than one style, they need to present to you as a collection that style and another collection. How many pieces are you looking for? when artists submit to you or maybe you can dive in a little can you dive in a little bit deeper into what the submission process is that might answer a lot of these questions yeah sure okay. absolutely Great. uh i will say very proudly roaring brooks website has a wonderful contact us button roaringbrookart.com go on the tab and and there's a button that says contact and then and then the drop down there's an artist submission tab and and you you walk through it you know with your name and contact details and it gives you the opportunity to upload whatever you'd like a pdf jpeg tiffs you know whatever and, and you can you can upload uh, one file you can upload a dozen files one file might have you know 50 images on it mm. so that that's a really great way to get the artist's work in front of us and my product review team because uh, we we get submissions daily, uh, multiple submissions daily, and we do look at them. We don't necessarily look at them that day, but we look at everything and we do make decisions regarding that. Um, but just regarding the actual submission, we do like to look at the breadth of the artist's work. Uh, if if there are multiple styles, show them to us. We we really want to see we want to see it all. And yet, you know, for that matter. You know, there might be a case of an artist, you know, has done just some beautiful decorative work. And then similarly, you know, to the question before about what turns you off, you know, they might also have this other kind of strange, dark collection that has nothing to do with, you know, the, the Roaring Brook genre of what we might be looking for, but they show it to us anyway. And in that case, you know, it's there, right? We'll, right. We'll, you won't hold it against them. We won't right. hold it against them, right? Right. But, but generally speaking, um, I, I, I would say that uh, artists who have multiple styles, they, they would say, oh, well, here's, you know, here's my, uh, my pastel work, for example, mm. and then, then there might be a half a dozen images in, in, in that group. And then they might say, well, but I've been doing, this is all in the submission process. They might say, well, but we've been doing work with acrylics uh, for many, many more years. So there might actually be more of those. There might be, you know, 50 acrylics, you know, examples of acrylics in, you know, different genres, landscapes and florals, you know, things in nature, et cetera. So, yeah, we we, we want to see the different mediums. We want to see the different styles. Some artists also are are really surface um, pattern designers. Um, they're not necessarily fine art artists, but they would consider them more like surface designers. So they show us collections of things that they've done uh, for uh, companies that they might have licensed to on their own, or that they're just they've they've taken lessons and they've they've gotten into learning how to do repeats and so what do you think roaring brook would you consider this so multiple genres that we look at and and that we do consider and then how many artists do you represent at a time so if you were to go on the website you would see that we have um quite a few artists that are on our artist tab um I will tell you that it's probably just natural for any business to work like this, that there are certain artists of the entire group. There's really anywhere from six to 10 of them that are going to rise to the surface. Mm. You know, imagine, you know, as our best-selling artists and best-selling in that they've become best-selling over time. They're, they've had, they've had a, a formula, what you know, whether that be 
the dialogue with Roaring Brook or that the, the retailer has had, has had a success with sell-throughs. So there's all different ways that people kind of rise to the surface, but ultimately, you know, we really, there's, there's a core group. And I just would like to say to the listeners too, that, you know, it is not out of the question for any one person to rise to the surface. So um, it's kind of like the Yankees, they have their A team and then y- yeah. the they're in the dugout. <laughs> so. Well, well, yeah, yeah. But, you know, to use that example, it, it isn't to say though that someone in the dugout isn't going to work hard and, you know, and, you know, have the right connections and just, you know, put their, their, their mind to the game in, you know, in your example and really then emerge as a superstar. So it's, it's, I, I, I don't want to leave the impression that if you're in the dugout, well, then you're always, you know, you're part of the B team. Right. Um, well, you still you get know, some playing time, just. Absolutely. And maybe, and maybe, you know, maybe you're only going to play a half an inning, you know, right, in, right now, but you know, you might be a, a you know, full-time, you know, nine inning player ultimately, um, you know, maybe next year as we, as we build the portfolio and we start getting placement. Now for your stars, um, are you able to share some, some sort of income numbers that somebody could expect to, to get if they are an active art licensor, licensing yes. licensed artist? Oh, great. Yes, I absolutely happy to share. So I, I want to first say that the it's a process okay um that the artists who are are the superstars um and they and some of them do take home a, a very nice six figure income uh for the end of the year by you know annually they didn't start out day 1 with a six figure income okay it's a process that uh as i said before that they started with maybe their first quarter, you know, they might have earned, you know, $200. Um, and by the way, that's also not unimportant to mention about the, the the time and the timing. I have artists that have been on board with me for over a year, and they're just now starting to earn royalty revenue. So there- Because of so- what we talked about, how long it might take for a design once it, once a manufacturer commits to it, and then that Santa- ends up in the store. Exactly. Yeah, that that's a perfect example of, you know, if you the artist worked on the Santa and last January and then it's first getting to the Roaring Brook portfolio cuz we found each other in June and then we're first turning it around in July and August and and hitting the road and showing it to all of our clients, they're then deciding and picking and if, you know, that Santa makes it to the in in the final leg and and it's selected. Um, then the samples are made and and then the they're first and shown to the buyers. So from the time that that Santa was created to the time that the buyers are actually seeing it, that might be a whole year right there. Um, and then of course, once the product is actually shipped, um, say you know sometime maybe six six to eight months later, uh, and then we would first see the, the royalty the following quarter. So you do the math on that Santa, you know, yeah. from the time it's created to the time that uh, the royalty is actually collected could actually, in that particular example, it could be close to, you know, 18 months um, yeah. you know, when we're seeing the, the revenue start to come in. Um, so, so anyway, it, it, is, it is a process. And, um, and I have artists, you know, again, they're, they're making, uh, you know, in, in the six figure range that they're, you know, they didn't start that way, but some of them have been with me for 10, 12 years and they've just over time have built up their revenue. And do you mean low six figures? Is that what you're, we're talking about? So I would say when you say low six figures, so some of them are making, yeah, anywhere from 125, 150, so like the mid um, mid 100s, low to okay. mid 100s. All right, terrific. All right, Gary. So this was definitely an interesting conversation. I really can't wait to share it with my podcast listeners. Is there anything else that you want to share with them before we wrap up? 
so yeah, thank you, by the way. This has been a great uh, conversation I, and, and some excellent questions, I might add. So I would say uh, to add that we love art and as you articulated in, in the opening that, that we're, I'm passionate and my team is very passionate about what we do. We, we love seeing creativity. It's just, it's just part of our DNA. And for all the listeners, I, I would say, you know, keep, keep, keep at what you do and, and, and really refine your talent and, and just keep creating and submit it and, and show us what that's all about. We want to see you. We want to see you as an artist. And to that, I'll say that trends are changing. Uh, we certainly know that the retail marketplace is changing. A lot of you know movement to online sales, so that there, while there may not exactly be a place for a particular piece of art or a specific portfolio, we do hold on to our submissions. And I would say keep putting it in front of us. And and as I said, you know, there's the market continues to evolve and turn into something new tomorrow that it wasn't yesterday. And that just calls for new and different art needs as well. That's great. So where should people come to find you? Should they look for you on your website? Yeah, you can certainly read about us. The most information is on on the Roaring Brook website, which is uh, roaringbrookart.com. You can find us on Instagram at roaringbrookart.com. And uh, again, look for us on Facebook, Roaring Brook Art. And we are on Twitter as well, at Roaring Brook Art. So. We're uh, we're well circulated. Our social media program is is, is building and uh, even more relevant today than ever. So yeah, we'd love to uh, meet any and all artists who are uh, happy to submit. I'll make sure I'll put all those links in our show notes, and that will be shulmanart.com forward slash ten because this is episode number ten. So anything mm-hmm. that we talked about today. There'll be links to that there. So thanks again so much for your time, Gary. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. This was great. Thank you. Well, there you have it. If you ever thought about getting into art licensing, that definitely gives you an overview of how to get started. If you enjoyed this show, I would love to hear from you. Leave a review on iTunes. I would love to hear an honest five-star review and your comment. You can also subscribe in iTunes, the inspiration place. And you can also drop me an email. I would love to hear from you, Miriam at shulmanart.com. So that's it for now. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com. You can do more than one take also. Hi, this is Gary Levine and uh, take two. I forgot (laughs) the name where I'm from. (laughs) That's okay.